All new for 1973, the Ben Hogan Company brings you the Apex Iron. 1973 Apexes have a certain cachet in the Hogan collecting community, not just by those who love to collect the irons for their unmistakable beauty, but also for people that enjoy playing traditional forged irons. Of the Apex clubs, it has a reputation as being very special, very unique, um, and obviously, as a result, very aspirational. So today, when you're off in search of them, the majority of the Hogan Apexes, or at least those that are being represented as 1973 Apexes, are not 1973 Apexes. So what I'll try and do today is point out a few uh, issue points, uh, ways for you to deduce if you have a legitimate 1973 Hogan Apex. If you spend a lot of time on the internet, on various golf groups, vintage golf groups, you'll likely have read that the frosty back, the frosted area on these clubs is a dead giveaway and a guarantee that they are indeed 1973 as well. Nothing could be further from the truth. Um, the frosty back apexes, as uh, people call them, uh, were not only a feature of the 1973 clubs, but also the 74s, the 75s, and the 76s. Um, somewhere in middle 1977, uh, they switched over to a polished back, and the 1978, the final year, had a polished chrome back as well. So although many may point to that as an obvious indicator of its 73-ness, it is probably one of the least reliable uh, elements uh, to help you identify which club it is or which year it is. Um, the most obvious way to identify a Hogan Apex 1973 version is by the assembly number that is located on the ferrule. Um, over time, sometimes these ferrules can be damaged, they could be polished, uh, they could have been returned for warranty work, they could have been reshafted. So it's not an absolute, it's a detachable part of the club head and thus uh, can go astray, but it is the most reliable way at a glance to identify a true 73. Now a closer look at the ferrule, you'll see there is a series of numbers and one letter that read horizontal, sorry, vertically uh, down the ferrule. The only alpha is the first slot, which is B for Bravo. Um, B actually stands for, so we are told, the month that the club was assembled. In this case, B would be February, A being January, C being March, etc. Now, whilst that's a good rule of thumb, it is not 100% reliable, uh, especially when it comes to um, clubs that are not in serial production, like for example, one irons, two irons in some cases, um, and other specialty clubs, they have a tendency to wander outside of the 12-digit range. And there are also some other special circumstances uh, where you could see the 13th or 14th or 15th letter of the alphabet being used here. Um, we'll get into that at some later time. It's not necessarily germane to our topic here today, but in this case, you can rest assured that uh, that is February. Now, the second digit causes a little bit of confusion. Um, you can see this one says three, which, uh, as you might think, uh, and rightfully so, re represents 1973. Um, the Hoking Company built and issued clubs in the same way that car companies do. The Hogan catalog, um, I happen to have one just right over here, which I'll try and throw into shot without throwing out the focus. Uh, that one's from 1969. 
the price list and the uh, order numbers and information for the clubs came out in July of the following of the previous year. So for clubs for 1973, the orders book the numbers the pricing etc was issued in july and those could be ordered in usually august sometimes as late as september for october november delivery uh, obviously trying to take advantage of the holiday season so whilst this is a 1973 construction there are also quote unquote 1973 apexes where you'll find a two in this spot, built in 1972. So that's where some of the confusion comes, because there are 1974 apexes that were built in 1973. People see a three in there and they go, oh, it must be a 73 apex. Well, that's not always the case. Um, the irrefutable number that you can truly rely upon as an indicator of 73-ness are the second, the second numeric, or third digit, and the fourth digit. In this case, it's 52. Now, inside that Hogan order book that I just showed you, um, all of the clubs, accessories, etc., had a four-digit stock number. And in this case, in the 1973 catalog, the stock number for the Apex irons with an Apex shaft, which this club has, was 52 Zero, zero. So 5,200. Um, that is the in prime indicator that this is a 1973 Hogan Apex. Stock number 5,200. Following years, these numbers changed. So 1974, and we'll show that in a minute, is 6,200. 1975, 7,200. 1976, 8,200, etc. Uh, the following two digits, not necessarily, again, germane to identifying its 73-ness, um, is a shaft flex uh, number as built, which in this case is a 3, a regular Apex 3 shaft, and another 3, which means it is a D3 swing weight. Um, so that is the primary way to identify whether you've got a 73 or not. Um, there's also, hey, from a distance, look at somebody's got them in their bag, they must be a true, uh, a true stick and a wonderful player to be able to play these. Um, are the trim rings on the ferrule? Um, this, it's a little beat right here, but you can see it is a black, kind of a goldish color, an oxidized gold at this point, a red, and another gold on top of the black ferrule. So these trim rings uh, were part of the not only the uh, 1973 clubs but also the 1972 clubs and in some cases as far back as 1971 uh, they made a reappearance uh, these gold uh, trim rings uh, later in the 90s they appear on some edges as well as the apex grind clubs uh, but it's also a pretty reliable way to identify that that is indeed a 73 um, a lot of them get damaged, some of them get knocked off, you may see no trim rings at all, but again, if you have the ferrule in place, that's a pretty good way to uh, identify it. Now, another way to identify it well um, is through the shaft band. You can see the shaft band here has a starburst and a number three in it, which, as we said before, means it's an apex three or regular shaft. And if we rotate it, we see it has the uh, prototypical Ben Hogan signature, the words Apex, and that's it. Just Ben Hogan, Apex, and the shaft stiffness. Sorry, my hand isn't as steady as it should be there. But that as well is a, um, an interesting way to identify it because... Later clubs, and we'll show them, have a different shaft band. So these ended in 1973. Another way, if you've got, let me turn the club around here, if you've got a 
unmolested apex. You can see this, I like to call this the Froyo band, which is kind of you know, like a soft serve ice cream or something, kind of swirls up. People call them different things. I call them Froyos. Um, they also have the Hogan uh, logo in red, the Starburst. And they have um, on the end, this may be a little difficult to show. It's out of focus. Maybe I'll take a picture of it and splice it in here. But you can see it's got the Hogan logo, kind of the earlier version of the logo. And it says designed by. And that's uh, one way to tell if these are 73s. If they were 70. Twos, they would have a red Froyo swirl band pattern. If they were 74s, we'll get to those in a minute, uh, it's not only a different color, it's also a different style. Now, what about the specialty clubs that go along with the set? Um, these were not part of ordering a set of clubs, but you certainly needed them. Um, one of them is the uh, Hogan Special Sand Iron, and the other is the Equalizer, the Hogan word for pitching wedge. Um, with very few exceptions, the Equalizers do not have assembly numbers. They um, can be dated with some of the other issue points that we've talked about. So. 73 equalizers are actually rarer than 73 sets. Um, they have the black ferrule, they have the gold, the red, um, the gold and the black trim rings. They also have uh, the other things that we've, we've talked about. They have um, the Hogan Apex shaft band, and rather uniquely, a lot of equalizers don't have the flex number on them. This one actually does. It's a shaft flex 3. Came with the set that I have, and again, just Ben Hogan Apex. No, um, no other indication. And it has the white Froyo style with the red emblem. Um, they're really hard to come by, so if you see one, with those telltale gold and red um, ferrule um, uh, trim, grab it. Um, this is equally a tough one to come by. Um, this is a special sand iron with, um, now the interesting thing here is it's only got the red, the gold, and the black stripe. It doesn't have the second gold uh, trim ring. And I, I don't know whether that's because the hosel is longer on the sand iron than it is the equalizer. Don't know. Could be. But likewise, it has the same grip, the same uh, shaft band, uh, etc. So um, this is the rest of the set. Um, one irons, two irons. Um, they do have assembly numbers, but they seldom uh, match the full set. Um, I believe, uh, while researching them, that they uh, were probably made in one big batch and then uh, issued uh, as needed, or they may even be custom. If you read the Hogan um, uh, price guide, it says uh, 30 days notice needed uh, for one iron. Um, so they're kind of outliers, um, so don't be surprised if your one and your two iron don't match. Um, they may very well have been ordered um, separately. Uh, or, or added on to the complete set. But um, equalizers, I've never seen the 73 um, equalizer with an assembly number on it, nor a sand iron. So plenty of uh, visual elements to help you identify it. Um, there are some other details um, that maybe we'll get into from a comparison purpose, um, but the way to identify the 73s um, are pretty much those issue points. The ferrule number, 
trim rings, shaft band, and grip. So what we'll do now is show you a 1974 for comparison purposes. Now this is a 1974 Hogan Apex, likewise a 7-iron, same as the previous 73 that we showed. And this has um, many similar elements. It does have the frosty back that we talked about. This area is frosted. Uh, Hogan kind of had a frosty feel to several of their club lines that year, those years. Uh, you'll notice that the, uh, if you have them, uh, the director irons uh, have a cutout that's frosted and then polished. So, you know, frosty was apparently a nice a design element that came up um, during this time. But we talked about the ferrule being a really important way to identify the club. Here we've got um, an F6, sorry, F46243. So we've got January, February, March, April, May, June. So this is what uh, June. Yeah, see, I can count. I'll try and do that on the fly. Um, this has a June 1974, and we talked about the two middle being the item number, in this case 62 for 6200, four for an apex four or stiff shaft, and a three for a swing weight D3. Um, you'll also notice that the ferrule trim rings are not gold anymore. They are silver. So black on top, silver kind of underneath a, a, a clear band, red and silver again in the normal black ferrule there as well. And here is another issue point for 1974. Um, this shaft band, if you can notice, maybe focus is probably not the best, but you can probably just make it out right across the top. There is what for the Ben Hogan Company in 1974 was Big Daddy. The parent company, AMF, came out with a directive in 1974 that uh, the, probably for stockholder reasons, um, that the Ben Hogan Company would start using the parent company's uh, name and logo on all of their equipment. So this started in the middle of 1973 and into 1974. So if you see a Hogan shaft band with AMF on it, you can see here it's got the usual... Ben Hogan signature, apex in large block letters, a shaft number inside the starburst, and then an homage to the parent company, AMF. If you see that, that is a 1974 or later apex shaft. And that carried all the way through as well to the grips on the club. And you can see here, I'll try and center that, the 1974 grip has exclusive with the Hogan, now new for that year, style Hogan. Uh, remember the previous one had a small H, um, tall H. This one has a more of a homage to Hogan's signature. So exclusive Hogan AMF design on the grips. Um, they are originally black and white. Uh, these are a little rooted, but unfortunately it's what's on the club. Um, I do have uh, uh, some others I probably should have used as a better example, but um, it had the, <laughs> it had, which is the operative word here, the Hogan logo, um, a white chevron pattern, and then uh, the Ben Hogan signature and the grip collar here as well. So again, that is a uh, way to tell um, if you've got original grips on the clubs uh, what their vintage is. 
1970, mid-1973 and on, um, the AMF logo makes its appearance. Now, the interesting thing that came out um, as we studied these um, a little more um, is over time, um, the clubs themselves started to change, even though they still carried the Apex name and generally look uh, visually the same. Um, over time, they were modified, um, whether that's for playability's sake um, or uh, the Hogan. Uh, there's an interview with Ben Hogan where he talks about bringing out new clubs every year, just like car makers do. Um, maybe that was just a quest to give the people something new. Um, but I think it gets at the interest and playability of the clubs over time that um, as the Apex line evolved, the construction of the club changed. Um, and what happened was that this pad at the back of the club, the muscle on muscle, got larger. Um, and when I say larger, it thicker. And it moved down slightly. There's a, there's a slightly larger lip at the top. So what you had is, I think, a change in playability for these clubs over time. The n most narrow muscle on muscle is the 73. Um, and I'll try and put these side by side for you so you can see the difference. But not only the muscle on muscle changed, but the flange changed a little bit too. Now, club to club, set to set, you're going to see some minor changes in the shape there just because, uh, because they were polished in a certain way. But in general, uh, the forging um, would have given the club finisher a baseline of what they were striving for here. Um, but when you see them side by side, you are going to see a difference in the way they set up and the way they carry their weight. And although I think this might be a little difficult to see, I think you can make it out. Um, this is 73. You can see the flange is more pronounced and the back pad is uh, comparatively thin compared to the 74. It's got a very noticeable lip on the back and a much thicker pad and a slightly less profiled flange at the back. So that may get at some of the desirability and the playability of the two clubs that the 73 carries, sorry, the 73, I'll point to the 73 here. The 73 carries a little bit more of its weight down low as compared to the 74, which is carrying it on the back. And that was very much a People say it's a Ben Hogan thing. Um, it's certainly a Ben Hogan company thing at this time, which was um, comparatively smaller total blade size with as much muscle as you could put behind where you wanted to hit the ball. And uh, that works for a great player. It works occasionally for a good player, and it frustrates a poor player. Um, that philosophy around how the weight is carried on these irons. So that may get at why the 73 is so desirable. I think it's easier to hit. I hope you enjoyed the quick tour through the 1973, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 Ben Hogan Apex irons. Uh, can you pick out the 73 from here? I certainly hope you can. It's over there. It's 1973, um, 74, 75, 76. And um, you can e see as well here just also some additional changes. Maybe we'll delve a little deeper into it without the risk of making this video too long. Uh, things like toe shape and uh, difference in the top line relief of the 73 versus say the 75, 76, and the more rounded profile there. 
with the hope of stacking the weight behind the hitting area, which uh, Mr. Hogan obviously felt was really important. Anyway, I um, again hope you enjoyed this. If you have any other interest in Ben Hogan irons, um, anything between, say, 1955 and 1990, I'd be happy to put a little video together to talk about the clubs and their nuances. And I hope you enjoyed this today, and I hope you're playing Hogan Forged. <laughs>